I want to say again, just happy Father's Day, and it's a joy to be with you. As you can see, I have my prized possession for this Father's Day. This is the gift that I got. This is a mugshot on the screen now, literally. A mugshot, you get my dad joke. This is what my kids gave me, uh, a coffee mug that says dad, and it has the nutritional facts for, I guess, a father or their father. I love my girls. Let's see what it says here. Serving size is one amazing dad, 150% strength, 200% hard work, 100% guidance, 30% dad jokes? I thought that would be higher. Wrong answer, 0%. Caffeine, 110%. Unconditional love to infinity. And then look at the note. Percentage of daily values may be higher or lower based on the child's mood. (laughs) So I hope all of you... Have a great Father's Day and get to spend some time with people that you love. Um, we're in a series that is all about the household of the living God. It's a great joy to, to have a wonderful family that God has allowed me to be a part of. And I don't mean that just at home. I mean that here with our family of God here at the church. We are lucky to be a part of the household of God. Amen. Let me say that again. We are very fortunate to be a ha- part of the household of the living God. Amen. And we are fortunate to be a part of this household of the living God. This is a wonderful place. And we're looking through what Paul wrote to his understudy in 1 Timothy. If you want to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy, you can. Do that now. And Paul is trying to help Timothy and his group in Ephesus understand how to avoid the drift toward church gone bad. Now, while you're turning there, I want to just let you know that Wendy and I We're able to travel to New Orleans just this past week to the Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting. Uh, Last year it was in California. This year it's in New Orleans. Steve, you guys were there as well. And, um, you know, it was wonderful to be there and see, what was it, around 13,000 Southern Baptists all flooding the scene. I don't know how well you can see this, but just seas and seas of Southern Baptists all underneath the same roof in New Orleans. Somebody asked me this morning, what was it like, Pastor, to be in New Orleans? Was it, was it you know, dark and, 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 and was it just like a, a feeling of oppression? I'm like, it might have been before 13,000 Southern Baptists showed up, but we changed the mood. We changed the scene, man. There were people uh, just everywhere, and it was a joy to go and just represent our, our church. I will say that one of the most controversial things that came up wound up being a point of unity for our church. We, uh, as a uh, a denomination, voted on the issues revolving around ordaining women as pastors, and an 88% overwhelming group of the folks there voted for a united front answer to that. And by the way, I'm not going to deal with that today, but when I get back, I'm going to take a couple of weeks off this summer, but when I get back, we'll be in uh, the second chapter of 1 Timothy, which is a real fun verse if you want to read that on your own. Verse 12 of chapter 2 is really interesting, so it's, uh, just pray for me as we enter into that uh, conversation about women and women in ministry. I promise it will be an eye-opening a conversation that will be affirming and, and encouraging to you, but also clarifying to where we are as a group and what the Bible says about this. That's a big part of understanding who we are in Christ, especially as a church family. Now, just as a point of starting our conversation today, I want to tell you a story. Uh, There's a character I grew up with named George. He lived in the house between me and my best friend, Kenneth, who lived two houses down from me. And in between us was this house where George lived. And George was older, bigger, more athletic than anybody else on the street and in our neighborhood. And in our neighborhood growing up, you know, this was before, you know, Facebook and Instascam and, you know, Snapchat, you know, all that wasn't out there yet. So we just went outside and played. Anybody remember what that was like? We just went outside and played. We played basketball. We would, uh, we'd just pick up a football and go in somebody's yard and just kill each other playing football with no pads or anything. We'd play soccer. We did all kinds of sports. But when George was there, what you need to know about George is George was older, and I just want to describe George this way. He was enormous. Now, back when I was growing up, my version of my body, I, I, it, was, it, it was called husky back then. That's what they called it. That was the nice way of describing, you know, young Pastor Stephen, husky, right? 
In fact, I remember going to the mall and going to like J.C. Penney's, and there was actually a, a husky section. I don't think you could get away with that these days. But this husky young Pastor Stephen was in awe of the enormous George who lived in between me and Kenneth, who was a year younger than me. Now, the reason I bring this up is that every time we would play any sport, you know, the way it started was you would pick team captains. And then the team captains would then pick their team. And if, if you were really unfortunate, see, George was always a team captain, right? He was always a team captain. If you were unfortunate, you got to be the other team captain. But if you were fortunate and you weren't the other team captain, the thing that you were wanting, you were crossing your fingers, hoping that you would be drafted by George's team. Because every time he would play in our neighborhood, his team would win. Every time. Now the reason that this is important is because George had this habit of picking the people to be on his team that were the least athletic and had the least to contribute. Now, you might think this was a nice thing for George to do, but it really wasn't. George was just doing this to show off. He would pick all the runts in the neighborhood, put them on his team, and then win and say, ha-ha, look, look at what I can do. And truth be known, we didn't really care. It didn't matter why George picked you. It only mattered when you were on the street I grew up on, which was, I'll tell you the name of it, was Periwinkle Court, all right? Periwinkle is a color, by the way, if you don't know that. I didn't know that until I was an adult. I just thought Periwinkle was the street I lived on. <laughs> but when you were on George's team, you just loved the fact that you knew that in the end, you were going to win. It didn't matter what the other team did. George would come up strong and we would win. And I think that you could have a creative connection with George and his relationship to the people on our street, this enormous, older version of all of us that walked around calmly but with a very strong presence and was always winning and taking people along on a winning journey with him. You could compare George creatively, especially where we're going with Paul, with God's relationship with us. God always tends to pick the least of these to use. You know, if you always have the best players on your team, winning is expected. If you always have the best players on your team, winning really kind of becomes not that big of a deal. We can all think of the underdogs that have won in athletics of all types that grab all of our attention. Last week, Paul even said himself in verse 15 of chapter 1 that he was saved by Christ, that Christ came to save sinners, and he says about himself, Paul says about himself in relationship to this conversation, that he is the worst, the foremost of all sinners. Now the question I have for you today is a question of distinction between two words. How well do you understand the distinction between grace and mercy? For Christ to save us, to draft us onto his team, like Paul, I would suggest is both an activity of grace, but also an expression of mercy. And I want you to see both of these in this scripture. I've titled today's sermon, Winning with the Losing Team. Now let me say something very encouraging to all of you. You're all losers. I say that lovingly. I'm a loser too, by the way. The Bible says pretty clearly in relationship to God, humanity as a whole is fallen, sinful, can do nothing on our own. God saves us out of this hostile environment, but he saves us even when we're still toxic, when we were still yet sinners, it's when Christ died for our sins on the cross. If there weren't sin, there would be no need for a Savior. And I want you to let this settle into your heart today. This idea of grace 
But further, the expression of grace that becomes mercy, as Paul describes it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And see the model that he has in his life for us. So our main idea today, I think this will stick with you, is that God uplifts you and me. He uplifts us without looking down on us. God uplifts us without looking down on us as he's doing it even afterward. See, the first part of this, God uplifts you, is a representation of God's grace. We know that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ. God uplifts us out of our situation. He saves us, but he also does it without looking down on us as he's doing it and after he's done it. That's the mercy. Mercy goes beyond grace. Now, I can tell that some of you are out there thinking, let me just say this. We got some pretty incredible people in the room. Would you look at the person next to you and say, you're pretty incredible. You're pretty incredible. As a group of people, (laughs) there's not just some amazing people in here. There's a lot of amazing people in here. Y'all are doing all kinds of stuff, running businesses, changing lives. We have all kinds of people in this room that are making all kinds of impact. And the people that are influenced by just the people that are members of our church is vast. But you got to be careful with that kind of thinking. As I look around this room, if we're being honest, some of you think God got a good deal when he got you. (laughs) Be honest. You ever give to the church, get that sneaky little feeling that somehow you've done God a favor? Like he needs something from you? You ever serve somebody and then got your chest out and start telling everybody about what you've done? We have to be careful to remember that we are the losing team and God is the winner who is dra- dragging us out of that, lifting us up. And as he's lifting us up, he does not look down on us. And that's the message that Paul wants us to pick up on. God did not get a good deal when he got you. And the grace is giving you something that you did not deserve, which is salvation. You did not earn your salvation. It's not by your works that you're saved. We all know that from the scripture. Zach read it earlier. It's by grace that you've been saved. Grace is getting something you don't deserve and could not earn. But mercy is not getting what you actually do deserve. See, there's a version of this where God could save us and hold it over our heads all the time. Look down on us all the time. But God doesn't do that. He restores us, he he redeems us, and then he says that we can approach him boldly, that we can pray to him directly. We don't need any intercessor. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have a priesthood that allows us to be in direct connection with our God. He doesn't call you a slave, he calls you a friend. And today on Father's Day, I want you to know, my, my dad's been dead since 1999, but my heavenly father has been with me every day since then. He calls us sons and daughters. So, the truth is that all of us deserve to be treated with skepticism. All of us have to be incredibly irritating to God. But instead of pushing us away or keeping us in our arms, like after he saves us, he lifts us up, but then he doesn't look down on us. Even in Matthew 9, Jesus said, God deserves mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy, not sacrifice. (laughs) There's a deep teaching there that we're going to spend a little time on today, but look at the priority. God desires mercy before sacrificial worship, sacrificial giving. He wants us to activate this idea of mercy, but how can we do it if we don't know what it is? See, the people around us are, (laughs) are difficult to deal with sometimes, am I right? But God can do something amazing with someone who is ridiculous. God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. Now, have you ever questioned why someone gets something that maybe you think they don't deserve? They win something or 
You know, they're, they're that person that's in your life that gets elevated to a place of leadership. Or maybe here in the church, there's that person that gets to teach a group or gets to lead this thing over here. Or maybe in your workplace, there's that person that gets elevated to a position or gets promoted. <laughs> you're looking at them and you're thinking, man, I know who that person really is. I know how they act. I know where they've been. I know what, who they really are. And I've seen how they've blown it through the years. You have to be careful with that because if you're beginning to think that you have everything figured out, that's the starting place of being judgmental toward everything and everyone. But remember, God lifts you up without looking down on you. He never leaves you the same. He's always going to have that convicting voice, a clarifying voice that's leading you toward holiness, but he's never looking down on you as you're growing. Remember, Paul called himself the chief of all sinners. Last week when we talked about sin, it's important to remember that you should know your sin better than anyone else's. The, the log in your own eye instead of the speck in someone else's. And you should know your sin better than anyone else does. God uplifts us out of that sin, but he doesn't look down at us on the way through the journey of sanctification. Now, you may not understand why God does that, and it may sound counterintuitive, but here's the deal. God knows a little bit more than you do. <laughs> a lot more than you do. God knows what he's doing. He understands what he wants from the people that he's calling and activating. He knows who needs to be on his team. Don't you think that it's a little ironic that he would take the Jew of all Jews and point him to go spread the gospel with the Gentiles? Paul's life itself is a blaring example of God taking someone that, that is in the wrong track to go in this direction and then putting him over there intentionally and saying, this is where you're going to go. That's why when Paul came back to Jerusalem, they were so skeptical of him because he had done so many things to persecute Christians. God wants you to be on his team, but he's going to pull together a team of crooked sticks. And he's going to use it to draw a straight line. And that takes a lot of patience. <sighs> Let me ask you, is patience easy for you? The truth is, patience is hard for us. Wouldn't you agree? But patience is real easy for God. Because he's already defined who we are. We are who he says we are. And we don't get to redefine what God has already defined. If God calls that person next to you that needs a little bit of extra grace and is a little rugged and ragged and, and, and has, has something glaring in their life that, that you don't agree with, that, that you know is wrong. If God defines that person through salvation as a new creation and begins a journey with them you don't get to redefine who that person is to your own liking to the world's labels when we place our faith in jesus christ all things old have passed away we are a new creation and we're already seated at the right hand of the father we're just not yet there completely so there's this messy middle on the backside of justification but before we're glorified and and completely removed from the presence of sin where we're all on this journey and god knows what he wants to do with you and he knows what he wants to do with that that kid in your life that's a real struggle and he knows what he wants to do with the drug addict and he knows what he wants to do with the person who's failed time and time again and he knows what he wants to do with the person like paul who did everything right and followed a religious system that led him in the wrong direction there's a lot of pain in all of those situations. But do you know today that your greatest ministry will many times come out of your greatest pain? <laughs> See, when somebody obeys God's call to serve, God equips them. That's why we have to be curious about what Jesus is doing in a person's life a whole lot more than we are judgmental. Paul, in verse 16, says, I received mercy. Everybody say mercy. Everybody still with me? That's our topic. I received mercy. Look what he says. For this reason. And today, I want you to see what that reason is. Would you stand with me as we read these three verses, 15, 16 to 17, and then we'll focus in on verse 16. Paul says to Timothy, this is a 
saying that's trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Yeah, a losing team. Paul says, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason. What's the reason, Paul? That in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience is an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Now, who are those who are to believe? If you believed in Jesus Christ, what Paul is saying is this is for you to see. His life is on display for you to see something about mercy today. And then he finishes up with something really important about God, the bigness of God, the king of the ages. To the king of the ages, the immortal God, the invisible God, the only God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we desire to be a praying church. And right now, we've looked into your word. We've read your word. We're getting into it. But Father, I pray right now through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate this into the lives of the people within the reach of my voice, both in this room and online, that you would touch us with your truth, and Lord, that we would have a deeper, fuller understanding of your mercy. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, amen. All right, you can be seated. So with the time we have left, I want to focus in on just this one verse, verse 16. And remember, God uplifts you without looking down on you. God uplifting you is the grace, not looking down on you is the mercy. So let's talk about mercy and how mercy is described. Mercy is not a general thing in the Bible. It's a very specific concept. And here's what I want you to know about mercy. Mercy itself is both an attribute and an activity of God. It is who he is, and it's also what he does in relationship to us. It's deeply rooted, mercy is deeply rooted in his unchanging nature. We don't have a God that's moving around and shifting with the shadows, as James says. We have a Father in heaven who is consistent, stable, trustworthy, faithful, and he's faithful in his mercy. And that's why Paul brings this out. It is in his very nature to be merciful. In fact, it is impossible for God to not be merciful. He cannot not be merciful. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, there's many words for mercy that are translated into the English as mercy seat, like the atoning blood that was offered to God in the Old Testament. To have compassion in the Old Testament is translated kindness and loving kindness. In the New Testament, you have Greek words that talk about having compassion and, and, and showing pity on a person in a loving way. There's times in the New Testament where it talks about God having pity on us, but also calling us to have compassion toward others. The the idea of mercy in Genesis has to do with saving lives. It has to do with uh, prospering in a journey, delivering someone from prison, getting out of situations is, is, is the merciful act of God. In Jude, it's the activity of not destroying lives. In Ezra, we see that it's receiving the favor of a king is mercy. Mercy in Nehemiah is even an answered prayer from God. And mercy is so much more than all of this. It's unfailing, it's unchanging, it's everlasting. And it manifests in our lives and in our churches when God's using us as a great sense of compassion. God's mercy is rooted in the goodness and love of God. God's mercy is great and abundant. It's faithful, it's unfailing, it's long-suffering. It's received by anyone who is repentant. And it's established and manifest in this idea of a mercy seat. And I would tell you today that mercy itself in your life and in my life, this activity and attribute of God, this is an essential aspect of who we are because it's rooted in our relationship with God. And mercy comes in a lot of packages. But I want you to hear this. Mercy goes beyond grace. And there's a story to tell. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9 with me. This is the verse that I referenced earlier where it says, God desires mercy, not sacrifice. See, the story here starts in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Jesus was passing on from where he was, and he saw a man named, anybody there yet? 
Who did he see? Chapter 9, verse 9? That's right. What's the name of this book? Yeah. <laughs> so Matthew was sitting at a tax booth. Now, why is Matthew sitting at a tax booth? That's right. He's a tax collector. And he said to him, Jesus said to this tax collector, this IRS agent, hey, man, come follow me. And you know what Matthew did? Okay, I'll do it. He got up and he started following this Jesus guy. Jesus reclined at the table in Matthew's house, and behold, I love that word in the scripture. Look what happened. Many tax collectors and sinners came. Uh-oh. And they were reclining with Jesus and all of his disciples. So now Jesus is in the room, sitting back at the table with his new buddy Matthew, and now all of Matthew's friends have come around, and they're a rowdy bunch of tax collectors and sinners. Now the Pharisees saw this in verse 11, and they said to the disciples, hey man, I'm looking at your, your, your guy over there, why, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. Put a pause in that for a second. We know that it says God desires mercy, not sacrifice. See, it, it wasn't just that Jesus was hanging out with the IRS agent here. It was, it was worse than that. In this day, tax collector, collectors were considered traitors. And Matthew had somehow initiated this relationship with Jesus Christ. He, he's got Jesus reclined at the table. And he invites all of his friends who he knew needed the same thing he had just experienced. And <laughs> these Pharisees start turning inward. To their little their little club what's happening is jesus is inviting sinners into a relationship with him and with god now here's the message for you today church we have to be very careful to avoid the holy huddle we have to be a part of the rescue mission that god is on god is in relentless pursuit of those who are far from him. The people who are close to you but far from God are on his radar and he wants to reach to them through you. Jesus says there is no one who is well who needs a physician. It's the sick people that actually need this. The sick people are the ones that need the doctor. The sinners is what he's saying. Jesus came to save sinners. It seems like such a simple idea, but how many times have you seen a church drift toward church gone bad, where it becomes this holy huddle where nobody can get in. The doors are locked to anyone who doesn't look like they have it all together. Jesus goes to these people. Look what it says in verse 13. Jesus said, go and learn what this means. And he references an Old Testament passage. I desire mercy and not sacrifice for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus says, you guys need to go and learn what this actually means. It's from your text. When mercy is lacking, all the religious formalities become meaningless. See, grace is personal. Excuse me, grace is powerful, but it's only personal when mercy shows up. The power of grace is saving, but it's, it becomes personal when you sit at the table and recline with someone. Grace is very transactional in that it saves us. It's by grace that we're saved, but mercy is very relational. Mercy goes far beyond grace in our sanctification. That's why when God uplifts you, he doesn't look down on you. Now let's finish by seeing how Paul has discovered mercy. In his own life. This story that Jesus is in, see how it plays out when Paul describes it. In verse 16, he says, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost of all sinners, Jesus Christ would display his perfect patience. Man, I've, that, I resemble that remark. Can I just confess to you, God did not get a good deal when he got me. It takes a lot of patience to deal with me. Don't you agree? But it takes a lot of patience to deal with you too. 
God displays this perfect patience as an example in Paul's life so that we could see it. Paul says this all the time, but especially in this verse, he's saying, look, I am nothing. I am a loser, and somehow I found myself on this winning team. And I don't deserve to be here, but the guy who is, who is leading this whole thing, he doesn't look down on me on the team. He's encouraging me. See, patience is hard for us, but patience is very easy for God. He has a perfect patience supply. And when you tap into him, you tap into that same patience, and all of a sudden, <laughs> the people around you are a whole lot easier to deal with. I said this last week. You know, the Jesus inside of me gets along really well with the Jesus inside of you. We may not get along very well. We may not have chemistry, but the Jesus that, that's inside of me and that I'm inside of, the, he, he gets along really well with the Jesus inside of you because it's the same person. See, Paul, you, me, all of us are the losing team. And God could have saved Paul by grace and not been merciful to him. He could have saved you and me and not delivered a merciful approach. He could have lifted us up, but then looked down on us the whole time. God could have saved us by grace and then worked us to death until we die, raking us over the coals all the time when we mess up. And sadly, that is what some of us think God is all about. If you were to loosely interpret what I came out of church believing about God as a young, it's not my church's fault. I just had a very casual approach to Christianity when I was growing up. I had this image of God as a young adult and even as a teenager, that he was this big old man with a white beard in the sky that was waiting for me to mess up so he could come down and thump me on the head. Like he was just waiting to just catch me doing something wrong. A big grumpy old man. Just in, he's up in the sky watching me all the time. He can see everything I'm doing. And he just wants to pop me on the head every time I make a mistake. But that's not what Jesus died for. Jesus didn't die for us to live that way. He died for us to be free. Not free to do whatever we want to, but free to do what we ought to do. And when we do that, for us not to be looked down on. See, when you think about God this way, you spend a lot of energy trying to avoid him. But when you think of God as a loving father, ready to embrace you, like the prodigal son, you chase after him. In times of need. Judgment is a part of his character, but it's not outpaced by love, mercy, salvation. He's not just God the Father. Don't you understand that there is a truth to this message? There was something that needed to be done and judged in our sin. But when Christ hung on that cross... He took all that for you. When Christ said, forgive them, they know not what they do. Father, why have you forsaken me? He took on the sin and the wrath of God on your behalf and on my behalf so we don't have to live that way. And Satan wants us to keep thinking that's what God is about. Have you ever had someone do a favor for you and then hold it over your head? There's a young girl that went to visit her neighbor with her mom. And the mom knocked on the front door and went inside and was talking with her neighbor and she said, hey, would you mind if we could borrow some salt? The little girl thought it was odd, but she didn't say anything. And on the way home, the little girl came to her mom and said, hey, mom, what? Why did you ask for salt from our neighbor? We have plenty of salt. Why did you ask for salt from our neighbor? We already have it. The mom told her, well, our neighbors don't have much money. And they sometimes come and ask us for help with some big things. And I want them to feel as though we need them too. So I asked them for something small that wouldn't burden them. That way, it'll be a lot easier for them to ask for anything they need. 
See, mercy goes beyond grace. Grace is giving someone something that they need, but mercy is not holding it over their head. The mom showed grace in her willingness to help their neighbor with anything, but the mom shows mercy when she evened the playing field, didn't look down on them, even though they were in need. Mercy can help you from backloading your gift with guilt. See, grace is getting something you don't deserve, but mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. In Paul's life, the example of Paul, this is what I would say, the Lord's greatest enemy, the most active man against Christianity in his time, as we see it in Scripture, became his greatest servant. Everybody's toxic. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why pride just won't work. Only humility does. So let me encourage you today to stay humble (laughs) and ask for some salt every once in a while. If it's good for Paul, it's good for y'all. So be merciful. Go beyond the grace. Lift someone up. and Don't look down on them. Put it simply, church, let me invite you to be nice and be nice about it. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you uplift us without looking down on us. Lord, I pray today that we would not just be generous people, but we would be people that give graciously and treat people mercifully as they receive the gift. Lord, I pray that we would have that relationship with you, that we would understand this depth of love that you have for us, that you would save us by your grace. Even, as Paul says, we can all agree that we are fallen and in need of salvation from your son, Jesus Christ. But Lord, we thank you not just that you saved us by your grace, but that you sustain us mercifully, that you don't treat us. You don't treat us as people that have come from where we've come from. But Lord, you restore us and you treat us like children, fully grafting us into your family. Father, I pray that someone here today would, perhaps for the first time, realize what you have done, all of the relentless pursuit that you have applied in reaching someone in this room with the gospel. This good news that even though there is a fallenness and a brokenness in this world that because of the work that your son did on that cross, we don't have to live in judgment, fallenness, and separation from you, but through faith in your son, Jesus Christ, we can become new creations. We can be in a loving relationship. On this Father's Day, Lord, I pray someone would understand at a deeper level, perhaps take a first step toward a relationship with a loving, heavenly Father, not the one that that we sometimes confuse you for. It's trying to thump us on our head, but the Father who is wanting to hug us and embrace us and love us and lift us up. The truth is, on this Father's Day, we all need a Father like that. Father, we thank you that you love us that much. Lord, I pray that you would use this time that we've had together today to remind us of the depth of of your love expressed through grace and through mercy. Lord, we thank you for Paul's words and the power of your word to change our lives. Lord, help us to be nice and to be nice about it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, 